Our next speaker is uh, Peter Jackson, colloquially known here as the uh, mathematician from New Zealand. But thanks to spending some time in the city of uh, fog and warm beer, luckily she now dedicates her uh, mathematics and, uh, and other scientific skills to investigating land management in the context of hydrology, developing tools for decision support systems and uh, all that. Uh, she's currently Associate Professor at the School of uh, Geogra uh, Geographical Sciences at the University of Wellington. Pat, over to you. Right. Well, it is a very big pleasure to be here and to be part of your celebration, Howard. Um, about 17 and a half years ago, um, a then young um, mathematician from New Zealand turned up with um, severe jet lag in Howard's office. So I've never been quite sure why he gave me a job because I don't think I was making very much sense that day. But I'm very glad he did. I actually originally went to do geophysics and I had this moment of huge frustration as an undergraduate um, in geology where they were looking at predicting where you might go in mine. And I remember asking, how certain is that? Not very. Can you give me a number? No. And so I ended up um, going into mathematics but actually, I've always loved the environment, and so now to be able to be a hydrologist and an environmental mathematician is a great pleasure. Um, I also just wanted to say, um, Howard, that I did actually have to think quite hard about whether to come and join this celebration because um, I really, really wanted to, but I was also, for the second time, making an attempt to actually do the Milford Track in New Zealand. And I did end up deciding this was too important, but um, if I'm booked on there, third time and you take another 10 years to do something amazing and have another retirement <laughs> celebration, I may not be here. I'm not missing, <laughs> I'm not missing my third attempt. First time um, there was snow and avalanches, this time Howard's celebration, next time I am going on that track. <laughs> Oops. Okay. So I spent almost eight years at Imperial um, with Howard and Adrian and Neil, etc. I worked on three different projects at the tail end of NIREX, which was looking at to radio um, nuclide transportation. Uh, I, did w I was one of the people working with the man, the man of LOCA, but the last thing I was working on was um, a project called the Flood Risk Management Research Consortium, and we were looking at the impacts of land management on flooding. And it was really nice because it was a very multidisciplinary project. Um, we were talking with farmers, interdisciplinary scientists, geomorphologists, um, sociologists. And so from this, we really found out that, yes, you could actually strategically plant um, trees uh, or other features in the environment. And if they were strategically placed, where well, they could actually capture um, large amounts of accumulated water, sediment, etc., then um, that had a big impact. I am really excited about where we've got to in terms of being able to re um, represent configuration inside our models. So, yeah, in the past, it was thought that this was impossible for a variety of reasons. Computers, sorry, <laughs> computers were slow, um, were slower, um, but also we thought that we needed to use the physics-based equations. So what we've actually done is we have basically said, Richard's equation is too complicated um, and intensive to solve. But, so we go back to almost a conceptual soil bucket approach, but we do that at very fine resolution. So it has all of the physical thresholds, plant available water, field capacity to saturation, etc. But because it's at the appropriate scale and level of connectivity, we can relate that much more easily to experimentally derived parameters. I'm not going to go into all of the detail in terms of different ways we handle space and time, but we have kind of a tier one, two, and three approach there's a modified flow accumulation algorithm. We are tracking water and sediments and nutrients down through the landscape, but that's modified to account for permeability in the storage. So that preserves very fine spatial detail. It works at the resolution of the digital elevation model. And then we have a cascading approach where we look at um, hydrological response units in the landscape, and that's how we get our time series. And again, we do sacrifice some fine spatial detail, but we're able to then disaggregate that back. So here are some outputs from um, this Lucy model. So um, this is a model I lead called the Land Utilization and Capability Indicator, and its birth was very much in the FRMSC work um, that Howard um, and Neil um, were leading. So we were looking at the impacts of land management on floods, as I said, but of course, when you talk to the farmers, they're like, it's not my problem that 400 um, kilometers downstream, um, they built on the floodplains in Shrewsbury. But if you show us some ways where we're not losing too much productivity and we get some local biodiversity, hey, we're keen on that. 
So in the first instance, we produce a whole lot of traffic-coded um, maps. As, as an example, again, this is hydrology, so flood mitigation. The red areas are areas which are already providing good flood benefits, so high storage, high permeability landscape. Orange is um, are areas where there's not much accumulation, and your green areas are targets because they're areas in the landscape of topographic convergence um, and low storage and or permeability, so that's really your biggest bang for your buck. And we then have a variety of approaches to layer um, our various things up and explore trade-offs and, um, if you're lucky, win-win solutions. And the great thing is that often things like carbon, biodiversity, um, water quality and quantity um, often go together so you can get bundles of environmental services. So why is this important? Because if you're going out and someone's paying to plant 100 hectares of trees, so Cadbury's, for example, for carbon credits, let's put it somewhere where it has other benefits. And we place things in the landscape um, makes a really big difference. Again, this is from um, the original study um, at Pont Bren, for, um, which Howard led. And if you actually looked at planting that the farmers did, um, they planted about just under 7% of the landscape um, in hedges and broadleaf woodland um, after the 1980s where they were paid to rip hedges and trees out of the landscape because of an agricultural subsidy. Uh, but actually, where they've placed it has a really big impact. So in terms of connectivity of broadleaf species, so this is really key habitat in Wales, they want to try and um, get climate change corridors for species. About four times that area actually provided um, additional benefits in terms of species connectivity. And in terms of flooding, it turned out that um, only about 3.2% of the um, trees were actually targeted into areas where the soil wasn't already quite permeable. But where, um, where the trees did go in, um, it again actually benefited uphill areas um, by again about another um, four times that area actually changed. And we have found quite a different range um, of numbers in terms of um, benefits, um, but it tends to be about one to 10 depending on the site and placement. If you're looking at small catchments, once you go up to larger ones, perhaps it's more like two to six on average. So I guess our point is that um, for all that it seems so difficult to do fine scale modeling, we think it's really critical um, so that our benefits are not underestimated. We don't want to just say we're changing a percentage of land cover, we want to be valuing what's actually also being t benefited in the landscape. So the underlying principles behind our Lucy model, uh, one thing was, uh, Howard, do you have a number in millions in terms of how much was spent on Pomp Bren? Several anyway. The Pomp Bren experiment and also the modeling, the postdoc work, etc. Okay, so about a million for about um, 12 and a half square kilometers. Um, which obviously is not something you can then kind of like monitor over the whole country. So it was really important to us um, that we could run it using nationally available data sets. So soil um, data, land cover data, um, and digital elevation, and then we can enhance that with local data. It's also modular, and it was created to be fast running. Um, so people were saying it's impossible to do that fine detail in a catchment scale model. So um, did as many numerical tricks um, as possible, um, hoping to be able to explore with um, stakeholders um, in small catchments in near real time. And what actually turned out is that it became efficient enough that we can actually apply it over all of Wales. So you can actually do simultaneous subfield to national planning. Um, and obviously that valuing the features and interventions um, is really important. So it's the area affected, not just the area modified and a range of approaches to look at spatial trade-offs um, and optimizing the landscape for things like uh, nutrient limits, et cetera. So I was really, really proud of this um, when we were able to run it all over all of Wales. We did this for a big um, four-year Welsh government program led by uh, Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. Um, and if you zoomed in on those, then you get um, five by five level detail. And the other thing that we're quite excited about is it has been picked up in the ecosystem services literature um, as the only generalizable ecosystem service model that works at both landscape um, scale and site scale. So that's because we have that fine level spatial detail and configuration. And also um, the United Nations um, are recommending Lucy along with Aries Invest and MIMES um, as ecosystem service tools to support incoming international obligations for environmental accounting, the SEER accounts. So that's keeping me pretty busy. Um, we've got quite a lot in the pipeline that we're further developing, but at the moment what we can support people using in 
well, in countries where it's already parameterized, agricultural production, carbon, greenhouse gas emissions, water supply and floods, droughts, erosion, etc. A variety of approaches to biodiversity, cost distance, connectivity and fragmentation, species richness, etc. Uh, and then various um, ways, as I said, to look at trade-offs and synergy identification. So please ask me if you're interested in any of those. Um, in Europe, we've been really looking at national scale application, but New Zealand has been farming um, improvements. New Zealand has been funding improvements to um, its uh, local detail. So in New Zealand, um, we're now able to take in uh, on-farm data sets um, and systems um, and bring that in so we can get information in terms of what type of fertilizer they're using, um, when stock are on fields or on wintering pads, etc. And we then um, look at not just trying to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus load, these are really important issues in New Zealand, um, there's a lot of regulation that's just come in, trying to keep our nitrogen and phosphorus down. Um, but we're also uh, looking at those zones of high accumulation, trying to find where we might be able to put in further um, mitigation or where you just might need to stop farming or, or, or change your system completely. And we're also really pleased about an optimization routine um, which can target those high loads and zones of accumulation and then minimize the loss of production, whether that's an economic value um, or dry growth matter. Uh, and then we've got a variety of ways of exploring um, mitigation scenarios. And you can either do that yourself again, um, talk with the farmer in terms of what he'd like to do, but we've also got some quick target tools in there. This is just an example from um, a farm in the West Waikato in New Zealand. And uh, her, her color schemes have just changed incidentally, but um, this is because we first were a um, green light um, to change um, and red light to stop things are good, but people got really confused by red being good. So um, <laughs> there was a really good reason. It was actually um, so that we weren't trying to say that things were bad. We were trying to take a um, positive approach, but it just got confusing. So after several years of trying that, we have given up um, and changed our color scheme. Anyway, so um, low and red, um, and then um, green is high, and you can see differences because obviously nitrogen and phosphorus respond differently um, according to soils and um, runoff and sediment generation. But once you start to look at um, areas in the landscape where you can actually really target um, intercepting it before it gets into the waterways, um, you come up with some really um, interesting opportunities. And so often we think that's a more cost-effective way. So rather than go, let's reduce um, the input load, look at where we can actually track that on the land. Um, same with flood water, hold it in the land where it's doing a good job, um, keep it out of the rivers. Um, that's just another example from uh, the South Otago dairy farm. And again, here we're actually also looking at dry matter production and we optimize this to meet nitrogen and phosphorus limits in the stream that the regional council um, had put in for regulation. And um, as I say, we've got um, now a new toolbox with a whole lot of automated um, scenario exploration techniques. So you can design your own by looking at the um, output from Lucy, but also just a few quick tools to, to explore. And again, when we first were designing this with farmers um, in Pont Bren, they wanted options. They didn't want to be told what to do. But then if you go to people with a whole lot of options, they also get confused. We've worked out we really need to show a few options, um, but then still give them the ability to reprioritize themselves. Um, as I said, our color scheme is in the middle of changing, um, but you can see here the impact um, of irrigation schemes, and we're also doing a lot to bring out reporting in terms of um, critical points in streams um, and boundaries, so we can track um, what's going in and out of boundaries of individual properties. Um, what's coming in at streams and out so that we can value the impact of that property properly, um, accounting for its location in the landscape. Uh, we're also doing some work in New Zealand um, with Māori, with our um, indigenous people, um, culturally valuing the landscape, which is quite um, interesting work. And again, in 15 minutes, I don't really have time to go into that in uh, too much detail. But there's um, really interesting um, a worldview which really looks at interconnectivity and so um, the way Lucy brings in these connections um, really talks to them, and they're really excited about it. Uh, just a little bit more in terms of um, what we do. We've also got flood inundation capabilities, um, so we can look at the impacts of changing management um, on peaks, and then we can look at how those spread out. This is um, the Hutt River uh, in Wellington, and um, it's illustrative um, only because we didn't actually have um, enough time to go and ground truth the DEM. But it's there. Uh, we've been doing work in Vanuatu, 
Uh, so um, here the red um, is where you've got opportunities to reduce sediments, um, nitrogen and phosphorus loading. And so the red areas are again kind of like win-wins where you can actually do things that um, provide benefits to um, all of those. And as I said, in terms of um, Welsh Government have um, been applying Lucy in an ecosystem services approach. Uh, and there's a variety of maps if you go to um, their website. Um, but here's an example where they were looking at using it to expand existing habitat um, and also increase um, flood risk mitigation, um, but not target any other high priority um, habitat areas. We've been doing a lot of work in New Zealand and in the UK to evaluate how well um, Lucy actually performs. This is actually uncalibrated, and we're finding that um, because of the small spatial detail, we think therefore the experimentally derived parameters um, do a better job. So we're still doing a lot of um, work looking at uncertainty um, and further calibration, but we're pretty happy how it does even in an uncalibrated state. So just based on our best possible soil and land cover information, um, there are lots of numbers underneath, so um, we bring out these maps, but you can also look at um, impacts of different scenarios. Here is um, output from a DEFRA project um, where we were asked to evaluate the impact of environmental stewardship scheme, whether that had actually done a good job because they couldn't pay for the monitoring, which is a pity, um, but also whether they could have done it better, either at um, less cost, same improvements, or more improvements at the same cost. And again, I won't go through too much of the detail on that, but for example, here we found that um, the scheme as it was um, had certainly decreased the loss of carbon in the catchment um, that would have happened if the catchment had um, carried in its management state pre the scheme, but that there was actually further opportunity. Similarly, you can look at various things like um, phosphorus export, um, different floods, so we put in um, typically um, summer and winter floods to try and look at how um, the land management changes those, because obviously summer floods we often get a bigger impact from land management. Um, and basically I guess plans, our plans going forward, um, and I think one of the reasons why uh, I'm so jet lagged <laughs> is actually also because I uh, just put in my own um, $10 million um, proposal just before flying here, uh, and that's working uh, with Niwa um, and a few other people. So at the moment what Lucy is doing very well, we think, um, is looking at connectivity um, and connections in terms of the soil landscape and huge detail on farm. But we are now um, collaborating with uh, the Forestry <coughs> Crime Research Institute, Scion, um, various um, university colleagues working in mountainous and pristine environments, um, and very importantly, um, better groundwater um, and better ecological modelling. So our hope is that we go from this, where we've got the soil and um, farms and a bit of cultural mapping and technicolour, but everything else is treated very simply, to something more like this. We were doing um, an awesome job in terms of um, pluvial sediments um, and ecology um, and much better groundwater representation, partially going back to learnings from, from low carb, but also model simplification work that's ongoing in New Zealand and around the world. And thank you very much for bearing with me on this second attempt. <laughs> Yes, there, there was a lot of concern about the model being used as a regulatory stick, so they very much want um, to have control of it themselves. And I should have mentioned that one of the things we think is quite exciting is that because you're actually able to look at um, impacts of that small-scale management, but also regional-scale outcomes, you're able to get stakeholders together, so local people who are kind of like embedded in the land, and then um, regional policy makers, etc., and really explore how those interconnections come. And in terms of New Zealand, we're actually partnering with the Farmer Cooperative, which has about two-thirds of New Zealand's farmers, so we have a level of trust because of that. But, um, and working also with uh, regional council and um, national government uh, to make certain that they believe it because that's that tension in terms of it being um, farmer funded and not believed by policymakers versus the other way around. Really important point. Yes. Neil. <clears throat> oh. Yeah, Beth. Um so surface water is relatively easy to put into these kind of tools because it just moves with the topography, right? Yep. But uh, groundwater is much more difficult to generalize in, in simple models. So can you say something about how you 
whether and how you approach that? Yeah, so we're looking at um, probably a diagnostic approach uh, where you look at the geologies um, and soil types and topographies uh, together. So, for example, uh, some of the groundwater approaches that we developed in, in LOCAR to look at um, residence um, time distributions um, will actually work really well in a couple of our permeable um, catchments with similar um, issues in terms of residence times. We're uh, applying the, um, we're looking at applying the Bucines a development of the Busanesk equation um, to look at some of our unconfined gravels, which are actually quite a lot of our farmland. Uh, and yeah, there's a, a variety of kind of simplification approaches we're trialing. So I don't think there's going to be one or even five models that cope everywhere, but we're hoping we might be able to find kind of a combination of 15 to 20 that um, together do enough, of course. Yeah, because we're looking at quality as well as, as quantity. And I think um, I should have also said, so I'm also um, collaborating with, with Neil and we're um, thinking in terms of how we could bring in mining, so I'm moving to things like the food, um, energy, water um, and mineral nexes, um, for example. Um, and also been talking quite a lot with um, Jeff McDonnell, he's visited New Zealand, um, and really watching what he's finding out. Um, so, yeah, I'm a mathematician. Um, once I understand the processes, I can normally find an efficient solution, but at the moment there's questions in terms of how things are moving through our soils um, and our, our um, groundwaters. So just keeping an, an eye on that. Yep. Uh, Petra, just a quick question. You, yep. you demonstrated a, a need for higher spatial resolution to uh, simulate the how much was that predicated upon the complexity of the model in terms of its physical representation and all that? If it had a much simpler conceptual model, would that be uh, Well, if you're looking at explicitly being able to look at that um, configuration within the landscape, I think you need something like this. Effectively, I've, tr I've tried to keep all of the um, fundamental physical thresholds um, and, and storage reservoirs kind of consistent and then thrown everything um, out for computational efficiency. Um, I don't think you need that level of detail everywhere, but I think so. It may well be that 90% um, of most countries um, it's not necessary, but um, anywhere where you are looking at, I mean, at the moment we've got fencing going and riparian planting, you know, wetland creation and little bits of a field. And I, I I just think you have to explicitly um, measure the way those, um, or model the way that those things link up to those particular problems. 